So Mark chapter number six is our text tonight, though. Let me ask you this as I start. What is it that amazes you? Like, do you, do you get amazed easily? Uh, for me, it's the outdoors. So when I go outside, especially when I'm doing a hike and I see, you know, those very nice photogenic areas, nice views, that just amazes me uh, because I see how big it is and how beautiful it is. And I'm just like, wow, God, that is amazing. Um, I, uh, this past, uh, the beginning of fall in August, my family and I were able to take a a little camping trip for ourselves, and this is the first time that we've ever went camping just by ourselves. And uh, we went out to Malaikahana, right there on the other side of the island, and uh, it was just, it was such a nice place to be. Uh, we pretty much had the whole site to ourselves. Uh, we, we, we didn't have any neighbors in the area that we were at, and so we're right next to the beach. And I remember this one night I was putting my daughter to sleep, and I was uh, uh, my daughter and I are to sleep, and I was rocking her back and forth, and just kind of like making sure that. Uh, you know, she goes to sleep that night, and as I, as I looked out on the ocean, it's pretty dark, but the, the, the stars, man, when you look up in the sky and you see just the innumerable number, the, the stars are just, it, there's so many stars in, in that night, and I couldn't help but just take a step back and say, wow, God, you are so amazing. Uh, you are so great. Like, the fact that you can create something like this, and it just reminded me of how small I was. And in that same moment, I even, I was reminiscing over my life and I, I thought about me having a, uh, a, a daughter. I have three children. I have a son and two daughters. But just me and how, how far God has kind of, how, how, how God has blessed me in my own life. And that's not, to, that's not to brag, but I'm just, I was just taking those moments of me being by myself with my daughter, putting her to sleep and just reminiscing over my life. And I'm just like, I'm just in awe that God would bless me in such a way. What is it that amazes you? Maybe for some of you, it's just sports. You know, when somebody does like an amazing play and he does the dunk 360, 450 around the court, like that, that's amazing to you. Maybe for some of you, it was this past, uh, it was yesterday actually, I was watching the, the NFL football game and my team lost, Patriots, uh, it's kind of sad. But uh, I was, uh, maybe for you, it's just watching your team uh, uh, playing their sport and you being amazed at how good they are or how, how, what, what a great play they made. But what is it that amazes you? What is it that makes you stop and say, wow? And it's funny, living in Hawaii, uh, you kind of get used to our, the, the scenes and the beaches and the weather and, and, and everything here. And then when you get a visitor come, and they come and they, they see that, they experience that for the first time, and they're amazed that you get to experience that, and maybe they're asking you, do you ever get tired of this? And for some of us, it's just we, we kind of get lost in, in work and life, and we don't even consider how, how blessed we are here. And it just, kind of, it just kind of goes over our head, and we don't, we don't see that. But for an outsider to come in and see that, and and be amazed, uh, they are amazed at that. Can I, can I flip that and kind of make it spiritual because we're, we're at church here, and I just make that into a spiritual point. But do you still get amazed at the miracles that God does in your life? Everything that God does in your life, is it amazing to you? Do you take a step back and say, wow, God, you are so good to me? Tonight's message is going to be about the disciples of Jesus. And I want to show you a couple of miracles which Jesus performed that the disciples got to witness. But the thing is, though, they got so used to these miracles that they never truly trusted in Jesus. It just, they just became too familiar with Jesus. Mark chapter number 6, we're going to begin reading in verse number 44. Let me pray first, and then we'll dive into our, our message tonight. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have, that, that you've given me just to be able to uh, preach your word. And I pray, Father, that it would be an encouraging word, uh, that I would not be speaking what's really what, what I want to speak, but really what you would want me to speak. And I pray that you would just uh, uh, be with us tonight, uh, fill me with the Holy Spirit, so that I could be able to simplify your word in a way that we could all understand 
and be able to be challenged and refreshed from it. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mark chapter number 6, in verse number 44, the Bible says this, And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. Now, this isn't the first miracle that the disciples uh, got to witness. In fact, before uh, Mark chapter number 6, I'm just going to go down the list and kind of name you the miracles that have happened uh, thus far. But in Luke, in John chapter number 2, Jesus turns water into wine. That was the very first miracle that Jesus does, and the, and the disciples were able to witness that. Uh, in John chapter number 4, Jesus heals an official son at Capernaum. Uh, that, that's a miracle. In uh, Luke chapter number 4 and Mark chapter number 1, Jesus drives out an evil spirit from a man in Capernaum. Jesus had the power to do that. That, that was a miracle. Um, in Mark chapter number 1 as well, Jesus heals, Peter, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law who was sick with a fever. In Mark chapter number, number 1 again, uh, we see the first miraculous catch of fish on the lake of uh, Gennesaret. Um, and then in Mark chapter number, number 1 as well, you see uh, Jesus heals many sick and oppressed at evening. And then in Mark chapter number 1 again, Jesus cleanses a man with leprosy. Uh, in Matthew chapter number 8, Jesus heals a centurion's uh, paralyzed servant in Capernaum. In Matthew chapter number 9 and Mark chapter number 2, Jesus heals a paralytic who was let down from the roof uh, by his friends. And then in Mark chapter number 3, Jesus heals a man's withered hand on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees were mad because of that. And then in John chapter number 7, Jesus raises a widow's son from the dead in Nain. And then we come to Mark chapter number 4. And Mark chapter number 4 uh, the disciples woke, they awakened Jesus because there was a storm and they're crossing the sea and there's a huge storm. Jesus is sleeping. Jesus is tired. But the disciples, they, they're, they're scared out of their minds. So they wake Jesus up and they tell him, Master, do you not care that we're about to die? And then in that moment, Jesus looks at the, the storm and, and commands, them, commands the storm, peace, be still. So he had power over the storm there. And then in Mark chapter number five, Jesus performs three miracles. In, in the beginning of Mark 5, we see the, uh, the maniac of Gadara, who, uh, the, the man that was possessed by a legion. Now, legion was just the Romans number, uh, the, the, in, to, the Rome, to the Romans, it was just 2,000 soldiers, almost 6,000 soldiers. And so in that story, we see Jesus miraculously freeing a man that had been possessed and had been chained up, but would always would have this uh, unexplainable strength and he would always break the chains. And he was living among the tombs and the people, they just got, they, they were scared of him, fearful of him. So they just, they made sure that he was living among the tombs. And you see Jesus coming over the sea and he's coming and he heals them and he frees them. And what an amazing thing that was. He, 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 the, the legion, the, the demon, the devils that were in the man, they, they begged Jesus, could you please don't just don't get rid of us, just cast us into the pigs. And we know that there were about 2,000 pigs in that, in that, that area. So, so Jesus grants their request and, and he cast the demons into the pigs. And the pigs, they go down the hill and they drown in, and they fall into the water and they drown. That was a miracle that the disciples were able to witness as well. In Mark chapter number 5 again, in the begin, in, in, towards uh, the middle, we hear the story of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, who when Jesus came across the sea, and he, he, there was a lot of people there, and the, the synagogue ruler was, was there as well. When he saw Jesus, he ran to Jesus, he ran, and, he, and he, he fell at his feet and begged Jesus to go and heal his daughter, his daughter who, was about to, uh, who was sick and, and just ready to die. In that moment, as they're heading to Jairus, the, the synagogue ruler's house, there was another woman who Jesus performed a miracle for, a, a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years. And she believed that if she just touched Jesus' garments, clothes, that she'd be healed. And she did. And because of her faith, she was healed, and Jesus healed her. And that was a miracle that the disciples got to witness. And then we come to Mark chapter number 6. And Mark chapter number 6, we get the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And just to summarize, uh, it's been a long day for the disciples and Jesus. Uh, they, they were actually supposed to be by themselves. I mean, they were trying to get to a place 
where they could rest, but the people, they, they just, they loved Jesus and they saw the miracle. Said, so a multitude just came and followed Jesus. And so because Jesus is a loving God, the Bible says that he was compassionate. He looked up and he saw the people. He was compassionate towards them. And he, he asked his, his disciples, is there anything that we could feed these people with? And we know the re response of the disciples. Uh, they, they said, we don't have enough money to buy food to be able to, to provide food for these people. And then a young lad, a, a young boy, was willing to offer up his lunch. And we know the story of the, the feeding of the 5,000. Two fishes, five loaves was what the, the, the young boy had. And Andrew got it and brought it to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, there are these two fishes and five loaves, but what are they among so many? And so Jesus, you know what, what's amazing about that, that, that whole story there is that Jesus never rebuked his disciples in their, their lack of faith. He just sort of just, okay, continue on. And, and he gives them commands to tell the people to sit down in, in, in the order that he requested. And after they sat down, Jesus blessed the, the, the fish and the bread and it multiplied and it was able to feed 5,000 men. Bible only records 5,000 men it's not including their wives or their children. And so 5,000 plus people are there and they're eating the food that was multiplied from two fishes and five loaves. And the Bible says that seven, 12 baskets were left over from this miracle. So I don't know how big those baskets were, but that's a lot of baskets of the, the, this food just from two fishes and five loaves. And you know what? The disciples witnessed that. All the, all the miracles that I just mentioned here, all of them, the disciples were there for. for. They, they got to witness Jesus perform some miraculous things. So throughout all these miracles, they saw Jesus do it. So let's read on. In verse number 45, the Bible says this, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. Now, the disciples, like I said, were already tired. Before this, they were actually sent out uh, to preach. And, and so they're, they're, they're beyond tired by this, this point. And it's getting dark. And Jesus sends them away. And he actually has to constrain them to go. He's convincing them. like He's telling them, look, just go. I'll take care of the people. And I'll meet you guys on the other side. I'll, I'll meet you guys there. Is pretty much what he's saying. So he sends them away. And um, I don't know if you've ever been tired, um, like, you're, you're winding down, you're in your home, and then you get an unexpected knock on your door and you have a visitor that you, know, you don't want to be there, but uh, they're there anyway. And because you're so nice, you invite them into your home and they spend the next two hours you know, trying, just talking to you and you just can't wait for them. And the disciples are that tired. Uh, they, just, they, they want to rest, but they're not getting that rest. Well, the disciples were tired. So Jesus sends them ahead, but he actually had to constrain them. And in verse number 46, and when he had sent them away, the Bible says he departed into a mountain to pray. Now, just pause for a second there and consider that. Jesus, God, our Savior, took time to pray. He, he made sure that he had a place to go so that he could talk with his father. That, that is a challenge in itself. Verse 47, the Bible says, And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And so even here just means it's pretty much late in the evening, and so it's probably like 9 to midnight almost. And so the disciples are on the water. And in verse 48, the Bible says this, And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on the sea when it's, uh, when, when it's stormy or when there's just huge waves. Uh, back in Micronesia, uh, we have our means of transportation to our other islands uh, would be by these 20 feet um, fiber boats, which are pretty much hollow. So it's not the kind where you drive. It's just you have a motor in the back and you, you drive it by that. And it's pretty much hollow in the middle. So that means that every wave that you hit, you feel it 20 times more because it's just it, you, you, you hit it every time. And, and I can imagine these disciples, they didn't have the boats that we have now, so they don't have like the cushions and all that just to be able to, 
uh, go through uh, the other side peacefully with comfort. They're, they're, they're struggling to get to the other side. The, the storm is contrary against them. That means that they're going against it, and that's the worst kind of waves to go against. It's better to drive, it's better to go this way when the waves are going with you, but to go against it, that's just painful. And so th- just kind of imagine that type of scenario as they're going through. The disciples are in the storm, they're, in, they're struggling. It's taking them forever to cross this lake. Uh, it's, it's said that it's about five miles just to get to Bethsaida where they're going. And so just imagine it's, it's late in the evening. It's almost nine to midnight, somewhere in that time frame um, that this is happening. And then the Bible says in verse 48 again, and about the fourth watch of the night, he come in unto them walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. Now, fourth watch just means that it is 3 a.m. In the, in the morning now. So this is Jewish time, but it is now 3 a.m. Now imagine in the, uh, it's even, late in the evening, all the way to like 3 a.m., and they're still stuck in this storm. They, they are struggling. They are tired, beyond tired, and they're having to, do, to deal with this struggle. Um, and then it says here that Jesus comes walking on water, and it says he made as if he was passing them until the disciples did this. In verse number 49, the Bible says this, But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. Now, for you parents, have you ever tried to scare your kids? It's pretty funny. It's pretty hilarious when you do it. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen like those scare cams with uh, when parents try to like scare their kids, and then their kids cry hysterically, and then they try to like you know play it down and say, "Oh, I was just joking. That wasn't really scary." I, I imagine Jesus <laughs> is having fun here. Like he was just gonna walk on the water and just be like, hey, guys, look what I can do. Like, I, I just imagine that this was supposed to be a lighthearted moment, but, but the reaction of the disciples is, is not what, what, what you would expect. It's actually, I guess it is what you would expect for us if we're super tired, it's 3 a.m. in the morning, and, and a lot of things happen in, the, in, in that time. So what happened here is this. They are screaming their hearts out like little girls. They, they just, they think, that they are seeing a ghost. They, they think that Jesus is some kind of ghost that is coming to haunt them. It says, for they saw him in verse 50 and were troubled. They really thought they saw a ghost, but then immediately Jesus comforts them. It says here in verse number 50 again, and immediately he talked with them and said unto them, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Then look what Mark says here in verse 51. It says, And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in, in themselves beyond measure and wondered. They couldn't believe their eyes is really what it's saying here. They, they were amazed that Jesus could walk on water. Jesus walking on water blew their minds. It's as if their jaws dropped and it's on the bottom of the sea. They, they were just blown out of their minds at the fact that Jesus could miraculously walk on water. But then the Bible says this in verse number 52, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. You know what, got, what that got me thinking? Their amazement, the fact that they were amazed of what Jesus did, was due to their lack of faith in Jesus. It wasn't necessarily because they believed Jesus could do it, so they, they were amazed at it. It was because they didn't think Jesus could do it, so they were amazed by it. They were amazed because they didn't think Jesus could do it. And even after a miracle like the feeding of the 5,000, the Bible says their heart was hardened. They questioned Jesus prior to the feeding of the 5,000. Could this really feed that much? Is this really enough? Let me ask you this as we continue. Have you been blinded to the miracles Jesus has been doing in your life? Do you see that it's God that's been working all along, or are you amazed because you didn't think he could could do it? Are you amazed because you thought that that prayer would never be answered? Are you amazed because your faith just wasn't big enough? 
maybe to others, your miracles are not necessarily miracles. Maybe to others, they're not. But to you, they are miracles because to have considered where you came from, the person you once was, your history, your past, to consider you, those were miracles that, is, that, that have been happening in your life. It's a miracle you are where you are today. And for some of you, that is so true. That's true for me. But have you forgotten or even overlooked the fact that God is the one that did all of that for you? Even after all those miracles, the disciples just never seemed to get it. Still had unbelief. Easily forgot how powerful Jesus was because soon after, they just lack in something. When, it, when another trial comes up, it, just, it, it seemed like they just forgot about the other miracle and just start un, not believing in God again. What about you? Have you grown callous to the miracles God has been doing in your life? The miracles that you've been able to witness. You know, winning 200,000 worth of audio and visual equipments was a miracle of God. Pastor's back getting better was a miracle of God. Ohana not only surviving but thriving during COVID is a miracle of God. People we've prayed for and have gotten our prayers answered for is a miracle of God. Having the opportunity to do multiple outreach events throughout the year during COVID has been a miracle of God. Seeing people's lives change because of the gospel has been a miracle of God. And guess what? You got to witness it. You, you and I are just like the disciples where we've witnessed the miracles that God has doing. And yes, I'm not just talking about the ones written in the Bible. I'm talking about the ones that are happening in our lives, the ones that we get to be a part of. You and I are the witnesses of those miracles. But the question is this, how have your hearts been through them all? How has your heart been when you hear about a miracle that is happening today? When someone praises God for answering their prayers, how's your reaction? When you hear the testimony of others during our membership nights, what's your reaction? When someone gets saved, when a teenager tells you she has a desire to serve God with her life, when a couple tells you they're finally having a baby after trying for so long, when a man tells you by God's grace he overcame his drug addiction, or when a lady tells you by God's grace she overcame her shopping addiction, what has been your reaction? When a couple testifies they were on the brink of divorce, but by God's grace their marriage was saved. When the miracles are happening around you, are you amazed at God? How has your reaction been? to the miracles that are happening in your, in your life? Does it affirm in your mind that, yes, it makes sense that this would happen because it's God? Does it ignite a fire in your heart to say, wow, my God, I just want to keep serving you because you just continue to deliver and you just continue to do things. For, like it, you are amazing, God. Does it strengthen your heart? Does it make you be passionate for God? Or is your heart hardened, calloused, or even indifferent, unable to experience the joy and wonder of the miracle? If that's you tonight, and if you have a hardened heart, and I believe one of two things are true for you. Either you are not saved, so you don't understand that relationship, so you can't really attribute whatever it is to God and give get, uh, credit to God, or you've lost your first love. And I know for a Sunday night crowd, most of us were saved. Have you lost your first love? Have you ever uh, noticed a, a dating couple in their first stage of dating? Uh, there is what we call an infatuation stage where everything about the other person is perfect. I love you because you have a nice smile. I love you because, and even if they're not perfect, it's just, wow, I have butterflies. It's just, you're amazing. Have you ever witnessed relationships like that? And then what happens throughout the months or years? We kind of, that, that lovey-dovey kind of goes away. I hope that's not true for our marriages. 
But that's almost true for all of us as Christians, where when we first got saved, everything was about Jesus. We were so on fire for him. Uh, we were so passionate. We wanted to serve God with our whole lives. We wanted to start a church, start a Bible college. It was like Whatever it was, we wanted to reach the world because we were so on fire for God. But then what happens? We get tired. Life hits. Things happen. Sickness, whatever it is, and problems. And over the years, we kind of gotten used to the, the, the miracles of God. And before we know it, we're not as strong, we're not as passionate, we're not as fervent for God as we once were. The Bible says this in Revelation chapter number 2, verse 2 to 4. I know thy works, and Jesus is talking to a church that did all the right things. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. But in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Is that you tonight? Maybe the reason why you lost your first love is because you're bitter at him. You're looking around and miracles are happening for everyone else but you. And you just can't see what God is doing in your life because you're, 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 you're clouded. I'd encourage you to read Psalm chapter number 7 and 3. Psalm 7 and 3 is about Asaph, a worship leader who served for generations. And he is on the brink of throwing in the towel. He says, truly God is good to Israel, but for me, my foot were almost, I, I almost slipped is what he says. And I know that Asaph is talking about how he's comparing his life to the world and how the wicked are prospering. But you know what our problem is? So often we look at other Christians and we say, you know, I'm better as a Christian than they are, yet I'm struggling more than they are. Why is nothing happening for me? Why are they living it up when they're not as strong of a Christian as I am? And we often do that. And the thing that Asaph had to do was he went into the sanctuary of the Lord. He went to the house of the Lord. Then understood they therein. And that's what we need to do. We just need to go back to God and ask God, what is it that I am? What is clouding my vision to see how good you've been to me? What is blocking the blessing that you've given me? In verse number, uh, in, uh, in Psalm 73 again, Asaph says this, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me, guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart failed, faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I'd also encourage you to read Psalm chapter number 37, where David says this, I have been young and now am old, Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lended, and his seed is blessed. Bitterness will cause you to hate God more and miss out on all the joys of the miracles. And if you have not been amazed by God for a while now, I urge you to examine your heart and see what is blocking the joy that comes from experiencing the miracles of God. The disciples witnessed firsthand the miracles of Jesus, but it seemed that after every miracle, there was some level of doubt or unbelief when they faced a new trial. In Mark chapter number six, again, we see Jesus goes into the ship and their disciples are just in awe of him. Why are they in awe? They've been with Jesus since day one. Like, they, they, they should have known that Jesus would do something like this. But they've kind of grown callous to all the miracles. And I, I, I looked at all the passages con uh, containing the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And I don't know if, if it didn't happen, but the, the writers don't describe the reactions of the disciples at all. Uh, usually you see, like, the disciples were amazed that Jesus would do this, but then you don't really see that in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. It isn't until we get here that you see that they're 
amazement comes back, that they're in awe of Jesus again because they can't believe that he would do such a thing. They're just amazed at Jesus. Whatever it is, it is that you need to do, and whether it is bitterness or maybe it's a sin or maybe it's something that you know you shouldn't be doing that's blocking that joy of celebrating and, and being amazed of God, whatever it is, let me take you to Jeremiah chapter number 17 and really search your heart. The Bible says this, the heart is deceitful above all things, verse 9, and desperately wicked, who can know it? But then in verse 10, the Bible says this, I, the Lord, search the heart. And maybe the best thing we can do tonight, if we are not in awe of God, if, we're, if we've left our first love, is to allow God to search us so that he could bring up whatever it is that is holding you back so you can confess it and make it right again. God continues to do miracles around you and even in your life. Don't get used to the miracles. Praise God for it. Get excited about it. Get excited about miracles that are not just happening to you, but are happening to others in your life. Whether that's a miracle that is happening to a brother or sister in Christ here at Ohana, or just some, someone out there, get excited about that as well. Um, I imagine as... If you all know, Mark is, not, is, is the writer of the book of Mark, but he actually, uh, according to traditions, he actually got his information from Peter. So Peter is the one that's talking to him and, and uh, telling him about the, the stories that he's writing down. And, and I could imagine Peter, as he's talking to Mark here, and as he's, uh, as he's writing down these stories, and Mark is maybe asking questions to Peter, and I could imagine Peter just saying, we didn't get it. I can't believe we, couldn't, we, we did not understand that that was happening. I can't believe that we missed the whole point. But imagine Peter now, though, as he's telling, this, he's telling Mark these stories and the faith that he's been able to grow and the, the amazement and how, how powerful of a, 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 an apostle Peter was because he was sold out to Jesus after he finally got it right. How is your heart? Do you get amazed at the amazing things that God does in your life? When you hear about others and how they're doing well because of God, do you get excited for them as well? You know, we might not all have the same miracles, but there is a miracle that we all share, and that is the miracle of salvation. We are all washed under the blood of Christ. And by way of closing tonight, I want us to sing a song that would kind of lift our hearts up and really praise God for what he's done for us, especially in this area of salvation, how he freely gave his son for us. That song is just, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And we'll sing that song, and then I'll pray, and then I'm going to ask Pastor Caleb to come up and dismiss us um, afterward. But let's sing, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your...